Shengen, if these new report throws a light on policies that impact on food security, food and nutrition security, in other words, not only just food policies, but also trade policies and the, and the like, what have you found is the best development that contributes positively in terms of policies towards food security? Well, first of all, food policy includes policies related to production, uh, technology, processing, consumption, and trade. So trade is very much a core part of food policy. So for 2012, so what are the positive aspects in the food policy areas? So number one, uh, many donors, many national governments have increased their investment in agriculture, in agriculture research in particular. These countries include India, China, Brazil, and some African countries. The donor agencies, including uh, Germany, uh, the United States, DFID, so have committed, uh, have implemented many, many programs in supporting agriculture and food production. And indeed, we have seen tremendous impact already from that type of investment. Increased production, increased productivity, increased smallholder income, and poverty hunger reduction. So we have seen some positive aspects of the food policy in 2012. On the other side of the medal, what, what in terms of policies hinders progress mostly? Some of the policies that have hindered the progress of food security, poverty reduction, or hunger reduction have been the same or similar for the last several years. Um, so yes, many countries have increased investment, but many others have not. Many parts of Africa still underinvest in agriculture, in agricultural research. South Asia continue to underinvest in agriculture and in agricultural research. And many countries continue to use export bans or uh, import policy to distort the global food markets. As you know, uh, when everybody tried to isolate their markets from international markets, it actually increased the global market volatility. And uh, this will come back to hit individual countries. So we need to work together to make sure that trade is more open, there's no trade restrictions, particularly export bans when food prices continue to rise. And we have also seen a lot of discussions, a lot of commitments, a lot of promises to increase investment uh, in agriculture, uh, to work together to tackle some of the trade issues, on climate change issues, to link agriculture to health and nutrition. But we have to make sure that these discussions, these debates, these dialogues have to be converted to actual um, implementation. So at EPO, we call it walk the talk. So we have to walk the talk to make sure that the discussions move to actual implementation. Okay, I get the, the impression what we have quite often, especially in the development arena, that uh, certain policies never grow teeth in a way, and you touched on that already. Um, now, having seen that so often, and also having heard the, the sort of reflex by institutions like you, walk the talk and so forth, do you have any sort of indication, do you do research also on why that is? How can certain governments claim certain policies and never really put money on it? How can that be? I think there are probably a couple of related issues and probably important issues. One is clear accountability. If people kept making promises, who are going to make them accountable to meet their promises made? So this is so critical. The second, we should develop some indicators, some measures to track the progress. So when we have the indicators, when we have the measures, so we can make the people accountable. Without these indicators, we will not be able to do that. So these two issues are intermixed the accountability and the way to track to measure the progress. 
wanted to touch on one other thing. Um, usually, food policies are somehow right now looking at raising agriculture productivity and all the processes related to to the outcomes to the food actually produced. Um, there are scientists, for example, Tim Lang, that indicate that this is not going to do the trick for too much longer innovation of, uh, of processes and so forth. Are you also looking in that context in overconsumption and lifestyle patterns and what could be done in terms of policies to, to, to change the outlook, maybe also family planning issues and so forth? Well, we do have to produce more. As you know, by 2050, we will have 9.3 billion people. So we have to produce 60% more food. For developing countries, the food production has to double. So we do have to increase production, um, increase productivity. But on the other hand, yes, there is a tremendous opportunity to make sure that our diet, particularly our diet in rich countries, are sustainable, are healthy. As you know, beef production or any meat production you use much more water, emits lots of green, much more greenhouse gas emissions. And all these so-called externalities or negative impact on the environment have not been taken into pricing these commodities. And overconsumption of these commodities will also need to um, heart diseases, diabetes, all these chronic non-communicable diseases. So our future diet pattern has to be nutritious, has to be sustainable, and has to be healthy. So the, the conclusion is, yes, we have to produce more. On the other hand, make sure that our consumption consumption pattern is also sustainable, healthy, and nutritious. You touched already on trade liberalization. wanted to come back to that for one second. Um, that since the discussion is very old, in, do you think that it is maybe not so much about trade being liberal and liberalization, but is it more about state interference that creates volatility, especially if policies change too often and the expectation in the market gives, gives rise to speculation and therefore prices might go up? Well, the trade liberalization or more open trade needs a framework, needs uh, some regulation from the global level. So if we have that framework, no country will interfere or intervene the market unilaterally. If they do that, they will hurt the global market. If they do that eventually, uh, they will also hurt themselves. So these two are actually interlinked. Yes, we know that there are some political interests in countries to, to protect certain group of people by using trade, trade policy whether it's long-term distortion or short-term interferences. All this will cause the overall economic efficiency loss, will cause more volatile global food market, which will lead to more hungry people, poor people. It will also give a wrong signal to producers because the producers will face very volatile, unpredictable market. So it's a lose-lose proposition. If a country try to use uh, a, a distortion, distortive policy to protect certain group of their people in their own country because of certain political reasons. We are here with the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. The donors obviously are also countries and they have interests. What, from your report, from your findings, Dana, would, would you say is a, a message to the donors? Well, first for me, I have to congratulate to some donor countries that they have really, really committed in supporting agriculture and food security. But they need to do more. More investment is needed. 
to support agricultural and agriculture productivity growth, particularly smallholders production and productivity, and to support countries' capacity. As you know, the Nakala Declaration was to use $22 billion to support country-led initiatives, country-led programs. So do make sure that the donor support will build the country's capacity. Do you have anything particular in mind when you think of that? Any concrete thing where you think the biggest impact could be doing this or that? There are many ways. One is to promote mutual learning among developing countries and North and South learning. Data, policy, statistics are particularly weak. So if we can help these countries to set up a good statistical system to monitor, to track their progress, to build their own capacity, then these countries will bring a very strong case to their political constituents to use agriculture to achieve broader development outcomes, such as nutrition, health, or overall economic growth. I think the donor countries should also improve the coordination among themselves and to engage with emerging donors, India, China, Brazil. So they have also begun to invest in, in food and agricultural development in many developing countries. So traditional donors, emerging donors can work together, share the experience, coordinate their interventions, and make sure that um, there's no, no duplication, no competition. I think the potential is just great. Thank you very much. Thank you.